There has never been, at least in my story, that overnight success story. You know, it, it, there's been a lot of hard in order to get to the good. There was a lot of challenges, a lot of roadblocks, a lot of like, what the heck am I doing? Hey, you guys, Ed, welcome back to the show. I don't think I could love this conversation any more than I do. Um, My guest is a new friend to me, but she might as well be family. She's a mom of three little kids. She is a digital creator and a YouTuber with a massive, massive following. And she's Middle Eastern. So we're both Middle Eastern. So we have a lot of fun with that. I am talking to Cezanne Hendricks. And Cezanne started a blog over 10 years ago, said no one was reading it except maybe her mom. She kept going and fast forward to today and she has built an absolute empire but she said she was not an overnight success we are talking about it with her including how she built it plus her forbidden love with her husband and what true success means here's our new bff Cezanne hendrix i'm like so warm right now i know did you have to like turn your ac off because of sound or no, I turned it down to, to 68 degrees because this is what you get to look forward to, Cezanne, menopause and perimenopause. And you're nowhere near that yet. But And you're it in it? Real. Are you kidding I, me? You look 20. Uh, <laughs> it's the Middle Eastern skin, which by the way, I like. can we please talk about being Middle Eastern? You probably don't know. I am half Lebanese and you are Kurdish. So we're oh. probably related. Somehow we are ethnically cousins, you know, the <laughs> Lebanese and the Kurds, yes. the food. OMG. Wait, I, I had no idea that you yes. were. Yeah. So well, I'm I'm going to be what your kids probably look like. My <gasps> mom was Polish and Lithuanian and my dad was full Lebanese. So hey, I won't be mad if, um, you know, my little one teeny in, or Amari turns out looking like you because you look oh. amazing. Your skin does not look a day over 25 girlfriends. So I need oh, I need all the tips. I need all the tricks from you. So, oh, hey, no. cool. I, it's just eat lots of olive oil. And, you know, that help. No, I don't and know. Hummus. Honestly, and hummus and baba ganoush and some tabbouleh and everyone's hungry right now. OK, so oh, we're, both, yum. we're both Middle Eastern. So Lebanon is a small country near Syria and Israel. But when you say you're Kurdish, that's essentially Iranian. So tell us a little bit about being Kurdish. You're full, right? 100 percent. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, my dad is actually half Kurdish, half Russian. Come on, he is like supercharged uh-huh. Kurdish. He's like, uh uh-uh, uh, I'm full blood Kurd. He's so pro <laughs> his Kurdish pride. Um, and then my mom is full Kurdish. You know, the Kurdistan region is totally split up, right? Between Iran, Syria, Iraq, mm-hmm. Turkey. Um, we're actually from the northern Iraq region right next to Iran. There's an area in Kurdistan in northern Iraq. When I'm standing there on the grounds, there is literally a mountain separating. And if you go and just kind of cross the street, you're in Iran. So they're all neighboring um, Mm -hmm. regions. And that's kind of where the Kurdish people have spread out. And now, you know, in the United States, the Kurdish uh, diaspora has completely spread. And, you know, Mm -hmm. we, we go to Nashville a lot. And believe it or not, that is where a lot of Kurdish people are. Really? It is like what Nashville? it's what Utah is for the right. Mormons. That's what Nashville is for the Kurds. That's where everybody migrated to when they came to the United States. That's where I was born. Um, and I love Nashville. So it's kind of every time I go there, it's like very shocking in a way when I hear people actually talking Kurdish and being familiar with the Kurds. That was like, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So if you ever go to Nashville, go to the West Side and you're going to meet a lot oh, of my yeah. people. <laughs> I cannot wait. So my dad, um, full Lebanese, but was raised in the Flint, Dearborn, Michigan area, which has a huge Arabic population. So I just love them. the people were spreading everywhere. Do people ever say you look and you're probably going to say, Paul, this was a great interview. Bye. Um, do they ever say you look like Kim Kardashian? Oh my, yes. Well, you know, I feel like Kim Kardashian's look has evolved. So I'm like, which version of Kim are we talking about here? You know what? I take it, you know, I take it as a compliment. I am all for, you know, the dark hair, but now she's platinum blonde. So that's why I'm saying which version here. Um, I, I, I have gotten Kim K, but I'm like, Hey, I'm not, I'm not trying to look like her. You know, I think she just represents for a lot of girls that look like me in Hollywood. Mm. She's kind of that representation of 
Middle Eastern because she has the mm-hmm. Armenian roots. Right. And funny enough, you say like, oh my gosh, I bet you didn't know I was Middle Eastern. I bet you didn't know that my husband, Stevie, is um, an eighth Armenian, <laughs> which Wait, is what? hysterical because when we lived in Glendale, when we were in LA, people, we'd go to like the brand area, like the Americana area where it is like covered with Armenians. And I would always laugh and say, you know, it's funny, babe, with your blue eyes and freckles, I bet it would amaze and shock these people Uh if I told them that you're more Armenian than me. (laughs) You know, didn't see it. They all he's like the classic all American boy, like you said, uh, blue eyes, freckles. Let me clarify, you look like classy Kim. So when you say which iteration, you're classy Kim, and she's lucky to look like you. Oh, I love you. I'll just say that. So hey, She's she's aging pretty good. I don't know who her plastic surgeon is, but hey, I'll, I'll take that, you know. <laughs> okay, Suzanne, I want to talk about your big break. So you're fairly young. You're a mom of three. Um, you're going to school for broadcast television, and um, you start writing a blog. And that's where things kind of, like, that's where the light bulb happens. Um, but within three years, you had created, launched, and sold your first business in less than three years. You grew your first business to over seven figures, and you did that by focusing on the good. Um, what do you think your big break was? Because here you are. Yes, you're a lifestyle blogger. You're a YouTuber. You're an influencer, a digital creator, and you have a massive following. But when you trace it back, what was your big break? Oh my gosh, let's talk about it, shall we? <laughs> you <gasps> Look know at what? what you just did. <laughs> you know? Yes. Uh-huh. Paula, it's I, I really wish that I could sit here and say, oh my gosh, it was this aha moment or mm-hmm. this big break for me was when this thing happened. But for me, I think over the course of my whole journey, I've been in doing this for a decade. Right. There has never been, at least in my story, that overnight success story. Right. You know, it, it, there's been a lot of hard in order to get to the good. There was a lot of challenges, a lot of roadblocks, a lot of like, what the heck am I doing every mm-hmm. day? Because when I started this journey as a blogger, I was studying radio, television, film at the University of North Texas. And my whole thought was, okay, I'm going to start this entertainment blog thing, talk about fashion and beauty so that it could essentially help open the door for me in the broadcast world. And I mean, you know all about that world. You know how competitive it is. You know how you've really got to stand out amongst so many other people that want to do the same thing as you. So this girl coming from Texas, I knew if I wanted to move out to Los Angeles after I graduated, I said, let me just try to get a little bit ahead. And for me, I thought I had um, an opportunity where I was doing this little internship with this website and I was doing all their blogs and stuff for them. And I had to figure out coding in HTML. And then I finally realized, why am I doing this for somebody else when I can actually create this myself? And so I remember I pulled so many all-nighters just trying to build this little blog of a website through WordPress. And I didn't even have the URL. I was just like, it was like, (laughs) at the time it was like, you know, I think it was called like, so embarrassing, but I think it was called like spazattack dot, <laughs> dot wordpress dot com. It's like Saz because I'm such a spaz for all things trendy, you know, cheesy. Oh my gosh. So I started that blog and I just remember even in that moment, there was nobody reading my blog at that time back in 20, gosh, it was probably like 2010. <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to treat this thing like there's a million people reading it, even though it's Mm. just my mom right now. I'm like, there's, I'm going to treat it like there's millions of people watching. So I took it very seriously and I started reporting the headlines and talking about the trends. And I wasn't even in front of the camera. I was making collages and things like that. And so while still getting my degree, I was finding, um, I don't know, I guess I was finding my voice through this creative outlet. And that made me in those early days just feel really passionate and inspired Mm. by the whole thing, which is storytelling, right? And so that whole thing evolved when I graduated, went out to Los Angeles and realized, wait, this whole broadcasting thing is a lot harder than I thought. And there's a million other girls, surprisingly, that want to also be the next Juliana Rancic. Like, what are you doing, (laughs) you know? And I I think for me, I, I felt very discouraged and I also felt very motivated at the same time. Like, I can't go mm. home, you know? So that's when I focused on the blog. I yeah. felt very called to do that. And it's funny when you focus on the thing that's not always the easiest thing in front of you. Like, it would have been easy if I just booked an audition and became like a broadcast journalism, you know, 
anchor for a network and got to show up and just like really put in the work there. But when I had to start from the ground up, essentially, mm-hmm. it was hard. But then things just started aligning. And then fast forward to my YouTube channel, opportunities coming left and right, being in LA as an influencer in the beauty space. And there weren't a lot of girls that looked like me. So I really capitalized on that opportunity. And then I think everything else, sort of like a domino effect, things just kind of started to yeah. fall into place. And yeah. I just kind of leaned into that. So that's like the really fast forwarded version of my story, Mm -hmm. but I realized that there was never that aha, big break moment. It was a lot of those little stepping stones that led me to where I am today. It was hard work and hustle. It wasn't just right place, right time. Had you not taken that internship, maybe the internship was your big break when you realize I can code. I can build a website. I'm actually kind of good at this and I like it and there's a need for it. So maybe that was your big break because it yeah. like it got you out of this like you were singularly focused on on going into entertainment broadcasting. You wanted like you said you wanted to be Juliana Ronzik and Ranzik and maybe that changed things for you cuz you mm-hmm. saw the opportunity. So Yeah, that's really I, good, Paula. I I mean that's the thing. Sometimes we are too busy romanticizing about our future and what mm-hmm. we imagine and what we envision it to be that we forget to actually fall in love with the now. We forget to fall in love with our life right now. And so I wish I could go back though and tell that girl 10 years ago, hey, while you're hustling and grinding, don't forget to look up and see the good that's all around in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, you are in your early 20s, like go and still live and breathe life because that's also going to pour into who you are as a creator and and a visionary. Like you need to not only blood, sweat, and tears, you know, pour into this career thing. And at the time that narrative was very much like prominent. It was like, if you Mm -hmm. want to succeed, you better sacrifice everything for it. And nowadays I feel like we're really promoting more so like wellness and the importance of the other things in your life. Like success isn't just about chasing Mm -hmm. the quote unquote dream of your job. So I wish I could go back and tell myself that as I was grinding (laughs) it out. But it was really, I think it was all meant to be the way that it panned out because it led me, you know, to where I am today as a mother, as a wife and an entrepreneur. And it is a juggling act, as you know. (laughs) Yeah, it really is. Your story is just really, really inspirational. It seems like kids these days when you're like, I hate the question, by the way, what do you want to do when you grow up? I have a whole book that says, (laughs) who do you want to be? Because I want kids to focus on the kind of person they want to be. It seems like everyone's like, I want to be a professional athlete when I'm older. I want to be an influencer or a blogger. Okay. So it's a Mm -hmm. very popular vocation that people, a lot of people are aiming for. And as you have just told us, it's not, I mean, yes, you experienced success at a very young age, but it wasn't overnight. It's been over 10 years. What advice do you have to somebody looking for their big break, maybe in the influencing space specifically? It's really important, I think, that like the generation that's growing up right now, right, that they understand that, you know, when it comes to your gifts, your God-given gifts and your talents, I just want to encourage anyone and everyone listening to say like, do not tuck those under a rug Mm. because maybe you're thinking like, I don't have... I don't have the means to make this possible because I am a mom and this passion project that I have, there's no way that I can pour into it. Maybe you're thinking that because I don't have a million Instagram followers, I can't express and show my talents. I believe that we all have a story inside of us that is just oozing and dying to Mm -hmm. be shared with the world. And I think the experiences that we go through in life, they're experiences that happen for a reason. Yeah. Um, you can always still find the good and hopeless moments. That's definitely something that I've seen over the course of my life, that there's been a lot of brokenness in my life. You know, even my relationship with my husband, like I had to go through the hard to get to the good. And that's kind of been the theme, I think, for my life in every department. Nothing was ever handed to me. My parents coming to this country as immigrants, I think taught me early on as well. Like we have to work a little bit harder in order to succeed here. Mm -hmm. And that always kind of, I always carried that on my shoulders. And sometimes it really intimidated me from even like 
putting my talents out there and my gifts. Mm -hmm. And so anyone and everyone listening to this, like there is a talent and there's a gift that you have inside. And the purpose of that gift and talent isn't for you to tuck it away, lock it up in a vault and not express it and to share it and find a creative outlet for it. Whether that's a little blog for you that you start and code, or maybe it is um, a fundraiser that you've been dying to start, you know, at your kid's school, or there's just something tucked away in you. And it's like, your heart is on fire to get it out. I just want to encourage anyone, everyone, like just start. Don't mm-hmm. let all of the what ifs, all of the forward thinking of like, how am I going to get there? Don't think about the million dollar idea. Like, how is this going to just start? That mm, is the good. hardest part is yeah. just start because we've all got those gifts and talents inside of us. And if I didn't take that chance, I wouldn't be sitting here today. You know, yes. if I didn't take that chance on that little blog that nobody was reading at one point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And and just do the next right thing. So your mm-hmm. blog, one of the reasons it exploded, though, and it became very popular is you listen to your people. You know, you started out doing fashion and then they wanted more beauty tips. And then when you started dating Stevie, who, who you call the all-American white boy, the <laughs> freckly-faced, blue-eyed boy from Maryland, they wanted to know all about it because this was a forbidden law. Love. Like you just said, your parents are first generation Kurdish in this country. And the immigrant mm-hmm. mentality is very much we got to hustle hard. And mm-hmm. you also kind of marry your own. So tell us about Well, by the way, for those that are watching this, because you can watch on YouTube, can we see Stevie? Can he come in and just wave? Or is he? Gone? I need to, he, 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 ste- he literally just stepped out. Don't Let worry me. about it. Well, he can come back in in a second. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. I'll literally okay. flag him. But you said, um, you talked about this forbidden love. Like I, you said, I didn't want to fall in love with him. And I told him to never fall in love with me because we could never be together because I'm Middle Eastern and he's white and my parents would never approve. Mm. So how did it all happen? This forbidden love between the two of you? You know, we were studying uh, radio, television, film, like I said, in college, and we were doing the nightly newscast together for the college news broadcast. Oh and we gosh. took it so seriously, by the way. Do you have a video of this? <laughs> Please. Oh God, yes. And I just, I'm like, do we really want to, I yes. thought I burned them, but I do. <laughs> I can send it to you and do not judge my hair because oh, it was gosh. teased to the sky. Oh. And you're Texan <sighs> too. So there's yeah, that. I, I mean, I remember hair. Stevie, when I walked into that season of my life, I was actually going through a really hard breakup with a Kurdish guy that I had been with for years. So I was at this stage in my life where I was like, I'm going to focus on my career. That's the one thing that's going for me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get my degree and I'm going to go do something about it with my life. Like, so I really tucked away the heartbreak and just kind of poured my energy into my studies and just showed up more on campus. I was commuting. So I was not the girl that was like living the college experience. And I said, you know what? I need to have more fun. I need to show up. So I remember volunteering in that news station and I walk in there and there he is. And he was doing the sports and I was the producer that night. And I just remember talk down every night meant that we needed to like say something positive to the newscast. And I just remember thinking like, dude, this night sucks and I'm not gonna be able to use any of this for my reel. Uh-huh. And I remember looking, Stevie was the only person who would crush it. Like I just thought, dude, he's really got the voice and the on-camera uh-huh. presence. So every talk down every Wednesday, my one thing would be like, great job, Stevie on sports. And he would just be like lighting up in the corner, but I didn't, I didn't have anything else good to say about the newscast. Right. So then as the semester... <laughs> As the semester went on, we became anchors together and we just were laughing and having a great time. And he really became one of my best friends. And at the same time, he walked me through a lot of my heartbreak, believe it or not. He's so encouraging. And if you've listened to our podcast that we've had, like Mm -hmm. he is just that person that wants to motivate anyone and everyone. And I freaking fell in love with him, even though I said I wasn't going to. And we moved out to LA. He was doing the whole acting TV thing and I was doing the broadcast thing and I was really uncertain whether or not we were going to be together and that was really hard for me because I loved my parents so much growing up my parents for us they really wanted to instill that even though we were growing up here in America and we were born I was born in America Mm -hmm. they really didn't want us to forget our roots and if you know about the Kurdish people you know Saddam Hussein has tried to wipe us off the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. So for my parents, it is in our blood to continue on the legacy of being Kurdish. So it was totally understandable that they weren't being like racist or like we hate white people, but it was just more like we really love 
being Kurdish. And we want to continue to see that legacy grow on and on yep. and on. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing today that, you know, they've come around, right? They came around two years after Stevie and I got married. It took a while and it, it was quite a journey to get to that point. And I even had to do go through it publicly because while I was building this life offline, there was still lots going online and the two started becoming interwoven. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't lie to my followers. I couldn't lie. And when I shared that story and what I was going through in real time, that's when the blog and all that transition from being this trendy news reporting gossip we'll column of tr tips and trends to now there's a face behind this, this, yes. this blog. And I started connecting with real women all around the world and it was their real stories and it motivated me and it helped me in my healing journey to connect with those women knowing like I'm not alone. And I love that today those same women are now walking with me through the journey of like having kids now and yeah. we're doing life together in a really crazy way that you get to do that online with people now around mm. the world. And so yeah. it was part of my story and it was all meant to be. Yes, it was. And I can relate to that when I went to Lebanon a couple of years ago. Um, you know, I'm married and I have three kids, but even then my relatives were trying to marry me off to my second cousin because mm -hmm. they're like, we have to keep the bloodline pure. <laughs> the cousins marry one another. That's just, yep. you, again, it's not, a, it's not a prejudice thing. It's just pride of the legacy and wanting that particular bloodline to mm -hmm. continue. So I totally get that. So now, you know, Stevie, start, you guys start creating content together and you have a book coming out called A Real Good Life, Discover the Simple Moments that bring joy, connection, and love. And yes, you both achieved success at a young age. And and people will think that once they get that success, it's going to satisfy. But mm. even as your careers grew, as you write in this book, you were still searching for that real good life. And I think a lot of people are going to relate to this. They're like, okay, I have achieved that success, but I don't feel like I am experiencing a real good life. How did the two of you find it? You know, I think with Stevie and I, what we try, what we try really hard to do is like, you know, live our life as authentically as we possibly can and just share bits and pieces of it as we go. We probably would have stopped doing the social media thing a long time ago. I think it was a calling where we suddenly, when we started growing our family and sharing the beauty that is marriage, the beauty mm -hmm. that comes from having children and also having big dreams. As we were growing all of that offline and sharing bits and pieces, I think what we realized was we are sort of being called in a sense to be a model for our generation, of like what it looks like to be a family figuring out life mm -hmm. and also enjoying it along the way. And that is like my biggest mission is like, you know, cultivating a life that I love every day, despite not being where I want to be. I mean, we're all striving, right? And even Stevie and I, we haven't reached the I have arrived moment. And when we have seen success and we've reached the milestones, like, you know, mm -hmm. you say like, oh, when I get to this, when I get to a million followers, then like that silly milestone, I had that. And it's like, once I got there, you kind of get there and you look around and you're like, oh, I think that's why so many celebrities, for example, even like they hit success and then they're like, well, the next thing and then the next thing and the next thing. They're and always at what chasing, point, chasing, always chasing the next chasing. thing that you forget to just stop mm -hmm. and love where you are right now. So that's what this book is really all about. It's a love genuine that. journey of the way I imagine it. Paula is like, you know, you're going to the freezer after a long day to get that delicious ice cream. You're so excited, <laughs> but then you stub your toe along the way and you're like, crap. And so while the cover of this book, you can see like, you know, we're laughing and we're smiling, but a real good life is not the good life that's being advertised in the Kanye West song and the, um, the worldly mm -hmm. sense. A real good life is really in these simple moments and allowing yourself to discover like, what is in front of me and how can I cherish this simple moment? And it's in that that you find the connection and the joy and the love in your life. And that's really important, I think, for our generation to know that. And I've had to go through a lot of like really hard times to see like, 
the good. It's always been there, but if we get so distracted, and I think today specifically, all those distractions with social media, with our phones, it's so hard to be present today. So this book is really about taking them through some seasons of our life and some stories that are hard, some stories where there's a lot of like hopelessness that you would think and really helping them see the good. And there's also a lot of practical things in there as well, because we're taking a 24 hour span. And that's what the book is, is it's being broken up into four sections of the day, morning, you know, um, mid afternoon, and then evening and night. And so you're going to go through the day, the phases of the day with us. And we're going to talk about the importance of reflection in the morning hour of your day and how that's going to affect, you know, as you're going through the productive focus hours of the day in the afternoon. Mm And so there's just so much in this book that I believe people are going to take away from. And it's not another motivational, like if you do this, then you're going to get this book. It's a lot of just like real stories poured out onto these pages, Mm -hmm. real tears. We're going to laugh together. We're going to cry together. And then I hope and pray that you'll walk away from this book and say, wow, I now have this new perspective about what a good life is. And I can actually curate that life and cultivate that life. And I can see the good that's in my life right now and just be more connected to my life. So that is my hope and prayer. I love it. Tell us a little bit about when it comes out, where people can get it. Yes. So you can pre-order it right now, anywhere where books are sold. And the book is coming out 1010. So you can't forget that. It's a 10 out of 10. Coming out on 1010. And it's my birthday month, October. So shout out to any October babies out there. When's your birthday? October 2nd. Are we tracking here? Are you October? (gasps) That's my brother's birthday. mm. (laughs) I love that. But I was born in 1975. So like you were born in like the late 80s, right? 1989. 1989. Okay, October Something about October, I love it. I'm not being biased, but I, yeah, I just October love that season. month. It starts mm-hmm. to feel like a shift. A, there's a change in the season and you start to feel, I don't know, the warmth of fall. Right. I love it. I know. I love fall. Um, and speaking of fall, you have fallen for your baby boy. You're now a mom of three. <sighs> you have the cutest kids, by the way, Valentina, who you call Teeny Amari, mm. which by the way, <laughs> if you haven't checked out Cezanne on Instagram, Amari is the best waitress. I and think Amari is the star of the she's family. The star. Okay. And then you just had your little guy. And I know little you're smitten. Guy. There's something about being a boy mom, but what's life like as a mom of three? And what kind of advice would you give? I, I don't like the word balance. I don't think we can ever mm-hmm. be in Same. balance. What kind of advice would you give to that mom, that parent that's trying to juggle in a little uh, bit of everything, work, life, that's, and their kids? Well, I just... My kids have, honestly, my kids have been my strength. My kids have actually forced me to find myself. You know, you always Mm -hmm. think like you're going to lose yourself in motherhood, but I will tell you, I found myself and it took a lot of surrendering. It took a lot of leaning into the season for what it is. It took a lot of being okay with like the changes that happen to your body and all of the things which Mm -hmm. we talk about too in the book. And I just want to encourage any mamas out there to know that like being with your kids and every expression of love doesn't have to be this larger than life Instagram thing. You know what I mean? I've realized that the five minute detours that I take in my day to just go sit with them and to be with them, those five minutes, oh my gosh, that just like builds up, right? And it fills up their love tank. It fills up your love tank. So while you're doing all the things, because that's just how moms are, we're juggling, we're trying to balance, whatever that means, yes. just remember the five-minute detour. Our kids Good. just want us to be with us. They're going to look back on their life and remember when we sat with them and when we entered their worlds for a second, went into the closet and did the little so playland good. thing mm-hmm. and just kind of immersed ourselves in their imaginations. I think that's what I'm realizing motherhood is. You don't got to do the most. You don't got to create these big experiences for them and spend all this money. Just go be with them. And you're going to find that to be so just therapeutic for you as a mom. And Mm -hmm. you're also going to see it just light them up. So that's what I'm trying to do right now with Oliver. Because like third time, as you know, you learn so much the third time around. Like, okay, I'm not going to worry about this this time around. I'm just going to lean into this. I'm not Mm -hmm. trying to get my body back right now. Like, I'm just going to be. And that's... That's the message I'll give you is like simply be, you know, and yeah. enjoy, enjoy today, enjoy today because it's, so it's not coming back. You're not getting it back. 
you're right. Just be present in that moment, which is hard to do when you have so much going on and there's mm-hmm. so much on the plate. But so it's not, I have loved getting to know you. We must break bread over some hummus and tabbouleh sometime <laughs> and talk about motherhood and, and all of the stuff. So Ugh. I've really enjoyed getting to know you. I'm excited to um, read the book. A Thank Real you, Good Life, ten ten. Discover the simple moments that bring joy, connection, and love. But and it's you're amazing. Such a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Congrats on this show. It's just, it's a lot of work because I know how it is in this whole podcasting world. But mm-hmm. like, if there's anybody who is crushing it, it's you. And oh, I honestly you. admire you because you are a working mama, but you have such a good heart. And the thank fact you. that we share the Middle Eastern blood and the I mean, love for hummus, we are. You're cousins. like my best friend. We're cousins, so maybe <laughs> Literally. sisters even. So seriously, right. thank, thank you, you for having me. Thanks, Thanks for guys. talking about it, Cezanne. Yay! I told you that she was going to be our new best friend, Cezanne. Thank you for coming on the show. And if you want to grab a copy of her new book, it is called A Real Good Life. We will have a link to it in our show notes. And I just want to say a big thank you to all of you who have tuned in, whether you're watching or listening to this show and are spreading the word. Um, I've mentioned we are building this show from the ground up, starting completely over. It's totally different from the last two podcasts that I've done. So I could use your help, whether that's rating the show or uh, writing a review. I, uh, I read all of them. And I love this review on Apple that says relatable and fun, relatable conversations, and and you love the diverse mix of guests. I would love it if you could just pop on and write a review or just share it with someone that could use some encouragement to help them live their best life. Um, I would really, really appreciate it. So next week, he is a man that keeps us laughing, and he's a new dad. I'm talking with the one and only comedian, Trey Kennedy. We're talking about it next week. <laughs>